What's up? What's up? Sorry, I'm three minutes late. Tried to be on time. What's up, Holly? <clears throat> Sorry, I've been away for a while. I apologize for that. I had some uh, family to see, but we're back in action. And I missed a lot. I did miss a lot. Um, obviously, you know, the pretty much the fallout with AOC. I missed that. Sorry about that. Um, but you know, you guys know where I stand. I've been, I have been talking about this stuff for a while. So, you know, it wasn't, it was still shocking and surprising, you know, the, the border comments, the border crisis comments. Um, and there was something else that I'm trying to remember what the other thing was, but I forget at this point, it's like a week old, so I probably won't cover it, but <clears throat> you guys pretty much know where I stand on that. What's up, uh, JC? What's up, Joe Nice? Let me uh give me a sec. Let me tweet this out. Tweet out the stream. Give me one sec. Just tweet tweeting out the stream. What's been going on with everybody though? How's everyone been? What's up, Jonathan? Sophia? Fractal, radical leftist agenda, what's up? All right, all right. <clears throat> what's up, Diego? You're competing with the funky academic for that Friday live show? Well, thank you for tuning in, at least for a little bit to this one. Justin, did you see Lee Kemp's video about water before you made your Kamala Harris video? I did not see it. I'll check it out, though. You know, I was just on Lee Kemp's show, I think it was two weeks ago. I really like Lee Kemp, and he covers, you know, I, it's wild. You see the the um kind of the fallout, I guess, or the ramifications of Russiagate when someone like Lee Kemp, who just spits the truth, every single time he tweets something, the same thing happened with the soapbox. Um, Human Rights Watch Watcher, that account. Um, every time they tweet something, it says Russia state affiliated media underneath it. So you're already going to have a bunch of people who, you know, have that lizard brain who are going to automatically react and say, oh, that's propaganda. Even though what they're fed literally every single day of their life, every single day of their life is actual propaganda. <laughs> Brian Frederick, thanks so much for the super chat. Welcome back, Jay. What disappointing news about the Amazon Workers Union vote? That is disappointing. It's very disappointing, but you know I'm going to cover that actually, and there might be some uh, positive type of silver lining type news. So uh, we'll cover that a little bit later in the show. <clears throat> Justine, hi Justin. This is Justine. <laughs> Justin with an E. Yeah, what's up? <laughs> One of my good friends from college, his uh, his sister was named Justine. McKay, it's my day off, and I'm kicking it with you, Justin. I appreciate that, man. Thank you, thank you for kicking it with me. I hope every I hope everyone's doing well. I know it's Friday, ready for the weekend. That person had the cop show up at her slash his house because of AOC. I don't know if it was directly because of AOC, but it was because of a tweet that they made about AOC. So I don't know. You know, I'm not going to speak without knowing the, the real evidence of it. But yeah, we'll cover that, too. We're going to cover that. Um, Dark Man X has left us. Rest in peace. Rest in power, DMX. Yeah, that's, that's messed up, man. That's messed up. You got a guest today? I do not have a guest. R yeah, RIP DMX. I'm going to have, I'm going to actually get Richard Wolf. So I guess I'm announcing it now. I will have Richard Wolf on the show. It's probably going to be later on in the month. But we, we did, uh, we did get <laughs> able to book Richard Wolf. So we're going to book him. Um, next week, I'm hoping to have Ash Kalra on who proposed the single payer bill here in California. So I want to talk to him about, you know, uh, what's it, what's it going to take to get that bill through and what obstacles, aka Democrats are standing in the way of that. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to having that, uh, having that conversation with him. Mark Georgianas. Hi, Jelly. Miss you. What's up, brother? That's my, uh, one of my former teammates from college. Thanks for tuning in, bro. It's been a minute. I guess I'll probably see you uh, in not too long. Fractal, thanks so much for the super chat. It's no co competition. It's co it's competition, like co-competition. Facts, facts. We're not really we're not competing with nobody. We're just we're just having fun, uh, live streaming. 
and talking about the news. Hoyas42215, thanks for the super chat. Appreciate that. Would you ever get to a point where you would support a primary challenger to AOC or the Justice Dems if they continue being loose, useless? Go Chargers. I mean, at this point, like this in, this interview with Jayapal, and, and we'll start there. I just released a video on it, so I'm not going to go all the way through it again, but I'll do just do highlights. And then we're also going to cover a part in Pramila Jayapal's interview with Marianne Williamson back in January when Force the Vote was kind of... Um, you know, when forced to vote, I think it had the, the, let me see when it was released. It was released January 7th. So yeah, the for, like forced to vote um, had just passed. I think because the sixth or the fifth was the, the Nancy Pelosi vote, the vote for the house speakership. So we'll, we'll cover that. But I mean, that, that changed a lot of things for me. I mean, it already was pretty much cemented in my mind, but hearing that she literally was saying that they're going to keep doing the same strategy and that they think that strategy is a winner and that they're actually making progress. And she admitted to wanting to have incremental change, like literally everything that the Bernie movement, progressive movement was against Hillary Clinton and the Obama types because of their incrementalist neoliberal policies. She just said she ascribes to that. She subscribes to that ideology. So, I mean, at this point, it's like, do you really think that we're going to actually get any transform transformative change when the people that are ostensibly, uh, you know, supporting the I ideology and the insurgency that we want to see in, in Congress are now saying that they support incrementalism. No. So if it comes down to that, yeah, if someone's actually progressive um, and they want to go in there and actually shake stuff up and withhold their votes for stuff. Yeah, I'd support them. Let's see. What's up? Atris Martinet, what's up? You and Medhurst need to coordinate your live stream times. Is he live streaming right now? I want to have him on the show too or go on his show. I've never talked to him, but I definitely want to talk to him because he does really good like uh, foreign policy based news, which, you know, he, I'm pretty sure he's from Syria. That's his home home country. So obviously he knows a lot more about that than I do. So I'd love to, uh, I'd love to talk to him about that. We got a, we have a, we have like four or five stories we're going to cover with this show. So probably in about five to ten minutes, we'll start. What if you invite Marjorie Taylor Greene for an interview? I, I doubt she'd uh, I doubt she'd accept that. <laughs> I hate our governor in California. Yeah, he's just, he's he's I mean, he's just another neoliberal. He's another neoliberal. And I'm going to be speaking at a health care for L.A. Um, they're holding an event with. Uh, this assemblyman Miguel Santiago, I believe his name is, this weekend on Sunday. Um, so I'm gonna be speaking with them about that or at that event. Um, and what I one of the ladies who was her name's Erica, she's like one of the leaders for healthcare LA. She was saying essentially this is gonna come down to whether or not Gavin Newsom supports it, whether or not um Gavin Newsom supports it. So that, that'll that be interesting. And I mean, I, I doubt he will. You know, I doubt he will. He's another neoliberal Democrat pay, bought and paid for um, by corporations. So, I mean, I doubt he will, but but we'll see. Challenge Marjorie to listen and talk. She might surprise you. Margaret Kimberly. Yeah, I want to get Margaret Kimberly on the show too and Dan Danny Hyphon. Caitlyn Jenner might run. Yeah, I saw that. Brian Frederick, thanks so much for the super chat again. Thoughts on Matt Gates' investigation? Oh, I need to do I need to do a story about that. I don't have one queued up, but you know maybe this weekend. I'll probably maybe I'll do one on Sunday because uh, I want to go through like the whole uh, series of events. It's been like a wild ride to this point, point. Um, and it started with that Tucker Carlson interview. So you know, obviously that happened when I I was away. I wasn't uh, live streaming, but. I do want to go over that. So thanks for the super chat. Andrew Dwyer, thanks for the super chat. You should have Kenneth Mejia on. I do want to have Kenneth, Kenneth Mejia. He's running for comptroller, which, I mean, I think essentially like you like are like the accountant type of thing for um for the city. And so he's running for that. And he does. He tweets out a lot um, about like how much like, for example, the Echo Park protest, like he tweeted out that the LAPD ended up spending like eight hundred or nine hundred thousand dollars in two days in two days to clear that homeless encampment. What could that money have done? How's all of those 200 something homeless people for probably years, for, for years. So yeah, I do want to have him on the show. 
uh hoyas 42215 appreciate the the super chat again what letter grade would you give biden administration so far i mean i guess that's all relative on on uh on what you expected i guess um i didn't expect much and he's not giving much so i don't know probably like c minus pretty bad gates trash there's so much more of this investigation the there is so much more to this investigation that is being led on. I'm sure. Radical leftist agenda. Appreciate the uh, appreciate the super chat. I just sent super chat to rich for you. To rich for you. What do you mean by that? Thanks for the super chat, though. Rokhan has just posted he's going to be a server for an hour. He's going to be a server for an hour to support $15 wage. <laughs> no way. Like, bro, we don't need you to, to to work a nine to five job. We need you to be in Congress and actually do something to ensure that people can get a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Anything else is virtue signaling at this point. Anything else is virtue signaling. There's too much going on in this country. There's too many crises that we're facing in this country for these these you know these chain tweets where they're like, "What would the fifteen dollar minimum wage do for you?" or like pass it on type bullshit tweets. We don't need y'all to do none of that. None of it. Twitter has already been algor uh, like has the algorithm so much in place anyway. You're not reaching that far of an audience tweeting that shit anymore. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> just more just JC, more performative nonsense. Exactly. To tell him you want him on. Oh, Richard Medhurst. Bet, bet, bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Appreciate that. Talking about Rich, Richard Medhurst. Yeah. Just force the vote, bro. Justin, Josh, you're not aware of how much they waste in their efforts to house people. They'll destroy anything folks build for themselves, but pay a quarter million per unit for a temporary shelter. You're not aware of how much they waste in their efforts to house people. Yeah, I mean, I'm, there's all there's always waste in, in our system. There's always waste. They'll destroy anything folks build for themselves, but pay a quarter million per unit for a temporary shelter. Yeah, I mean, that's the same like the same thing they did with the um, same thing you did with the Cobra subsidies. Instead of it's literally like. 20 percent um as expensive if you just expand medicare but then instead they're going to pour more and more billions of dollars taxpayer dollars into cobra which is just a health a giveaway to the health insurance companies we all know this but they do it anyway and then the fact that you have progressives out there like aoc going on instagram and fucking defending that shit is ridiculous is ridiculous I mean, that should have been that alone. You know, we have all these these, uh, you know, pieces of evidence to show us that they're not actually in there fighting for us. You know, I think this Pramaya Jayapal interview was like, you know, the nail in the coffin for me. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of pieces of evidence before to show that this is exactly what they've been doing. Hoy is again with the super chat. Appreciate that, man. Really do need more athletes like you, man. You're an inspiration. Hey man, I'm out there trying to make more. I'm trying to make more athletes like like myself. And, and the crazy thing is, a lot of athletes come, you know, especially when you get to the professional level, come from communities that are decrepit, that are, um, you know, have dilapidated houses, just boarded up churches, just everything, you know, no money there, no jobs there, no opportunity. And so we really, <laughs> we all should be lefties. Just based off that, just based off where we come from, right? And where a lot of people's families still live. And the people they grew up with still live, you know? So I mean that's what that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it works out. Fractal again with the super chat. Appreciate that again, man. Check out third paradigm po podcast on SoundCloud. They would love to have you as a guest this summer. Okay. I'll check that out. I'll have to write that down. It's not waste. It's oiling the political machinery, including housing contractors, administrators, social workers. Mm -hmm. Do you get a lot of static for your views from your coworkers or do they mostly leave you be? I mean, either leave me be or you know, I mean, a lot of them. I won't say a lot. I mean, a certain amount of them agree. You know, there's obviously a certain amount that are right wingers. You know, they come from conservative backgrounds and, you know. They never, you know, deprogram themselves. So just like if you come from a liberal program uh, background, you don't deprogram yourself. You'll be a liberal. You know, that's how that's how it that's how it works in this country. So there's a lot of people, um, or at least a certain amount of people that are conservatives too. But I am so down to have these conversations, right? I'm down to have these conversations and and try and just by the conviction of my argument, win them over. Maybe not right away, but you know, if you make them go back and actually think about something you said, because you got their ass. 
um, because they didn't know a stat or they didn't know, you know, how things actually work. And I do, then, you know, you might be able to change their mind eventually. A tradition of athlete activists, Russell, Carlos, Smith, Brown. Yeah. Even Barkley on occasion. Yep. Barkley on occasion. Muhammad Ali. Mm hmm. Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's jump into this. Let's jump into this. Um, Pramila Jayapal interview. Like I said, I already covered um I already covered uh I covered the I already did a story on it, so I'm just gonna cover the highlights. I'm just gonna cover the highlights, but um this was stunning. This interview was stunning because I mean she just pretty much came out and admitted that they're not gonna fight on anything. They're not gonna they're not gonna fight on anything. So let's jump into that. All right, so it says Representative Jayapal. Here we go. Representative Jayapal on how she is pushing Biden to be more progressive and creating the tipping point for change. So I right, let me hit the let me hit the highlights because these are the, the, the most important parts. Here we go. But legislating in a government under unified democratic control is a more nuanced project than pushing for ambitious proposals from the outside or even from the minority party. Jayapal's continued influence in D.C. depends on her ability to convince her caucus that compromise and incremental gains, incremental gains, can sometimes be the best way forward. And on her success at making that true, governing is different than opposing, she says. And I think we are all getting used to the idea that we are governing. There's so much caked into that right there. I mean, she's at she's admitting just flat out, flat out that incremental gains and compromise can sometimes be the best way forward for who though who who is incre who is are these incremental gains helping who because it's not helping the people that can barely afford their rent and can barely afford their you know healthcare payments can't afford gas anymore foods rising in prices middle class are being priced out of homes so we're in a moment in time where these incremental gains are not enough I mean, they ne they really never have been enough if you're in, you know, a, a, a prosecuted minority, an oppressed minority. You know what I mean? So the, the fact that she's willing to just come out and say governing is different than opposing, and we're all getting used to the idea of governing. And so when we're opposing, we can actually stand up and be, you know, righteous and boisterous and loud in what we want and what we say is bare minimum, $15 minimum wage, health, uh, Medicare for all. Right. Ending these wars, investing, truly investing in infrastructure. When we're opposing, we can say all these things. We can say all these things. Once we get into govern in, into the place where we're actually governing, where we're not just opposing and saying things where we don't have any control. Once we actually get to the point where we can govern now, now we have to change. Everything's more nuanced now. We have to change our tone. We have to accept incremental gains. We have to accept compromise. But the compromises that they're accepting is not, oh, we were fighting for $25 minimum wage and, you know, we got somewhere between 15 and 18 bucks. No, no, no. The compromise that they accepted with the American Rescue Plan was that there was going to be no change in the minimum wage. None. None at all. That's the compromise they accepted. So that's not even an incremental gain. That's literally nothing. And because of uh, the inflationary, uh, you know, effects of what's going on, you know, in the country right now, it's actually a loss because the people's the, the people's wage is still 725 even though housing's more expensive, even though um food is more expensive, gas is more expensive, everything is more expensive, so people are losing purchasing power. So while you're talking about incremental gains and compromise, there's people out there who are starting to completely be priced out of of affording the bare minimum to live and that's already that's already happened right that's already been happening for decades but it's going to happen at an even faster clip now so i mean that was just stunning and and then here we go about the elaine the filibuster the central question for jaya on the left is how and who wrote this by the way i didn't even mention that abigail abrams because a lot of this stuff isn't isn't quoted it's what she's saying but she's just completely apologizing for you know, inaction. I mean, that's what it is. It's rationalizing away inaction. 
So she says the central question for Jayapal on the left is, is how far Biden is willing to go. Biden doesn't support Medicare for all, which is one of Jayapal's signature policies. And he's more moderate on most economic issues, on all economic issues, than Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, whom Jayapal endorsed in the presidential primary. Nor does Biden so far support eliminating the filibuster, the Senate rule that effectively requires 60 votes to pass most legislation, which Jayapal and other progressives want to scrap. Right. So if you want to scrap it now, why why do progressives want to scrap it now? Every everyone who is, you know, a Democrat should want to scrap it because you're not going to get anything done. You're not going to get anything done because you can only pass so many reconciliation bills. You can only pass so many things through reconciliation. And with the filibuster in place, you're literally not going to be able to govern. So that's why a normal person would want to eliminate the filibuster. And the fact that once Republicans get back in control, they're just going to do it. They're just going to nuke it. They did it for the Supreme Court nominee nominees. What makes you think they're not going to do it? Uh, you know, for the Senate in general. But if you're not willing to do anything about it, if you're not willing to actually play hardball, say, I'm not going to support something until you get Joe Biden. until you go out there and get Joe Manchin to support at least reforming the filibuster, if not eliminating it altogether. Then what are you, then what's the point of you even being there? What, literally, what is the point? Because it's almost even worse knowing that you actually know what the right thing is to do. And, and what the right legislation needs to be passed, but you're not willing to do anything about it. You're willing to accept compromising and incremental gains, which I just explained are not even incremental. In a lot of ways, they're, it's negative, it's losses. So, and, and, and the cra- the cra- this is the craziest, this is the craziest shit I've heard in so long. Like, I'm not joking. But Jayapal, here, let me make it bigger. But Jayapal says she has never been interested in replicating the antagonistic relationship between the right-wing House, Free- right-wing House Freedom Caucus and Republican leadership that divided the GOP starting in 2015. What, but she also, what she also leaves out is the fact that that Freedom Caucus was able to get rid of John Boehner, was able to get rid of Paul Ryan, who were the two stalwarts of the establishment in the Republican Party. And they were also able to grow their coalition and grow their brand or whatever, so much so that they set the stage for Donald Trump. So she's she's already omitting the actual gains, the real gains that the House Freedom Caucus got in their crazy right wing framework and everything they were pushing uh, within the Republican Party. She, She continues saying instead of acting as an opposition arm, she says she wants to be a proposition one proposing the most progressive ideas possible and framing them in ways that can persuade her colleagues and the president to support them. How naive of a statement is this? (laughs) How naive can you be? Do you really think by the conviction of your argument, you're going to get Joe Manchin or Joe Biden, who's had decades of corruption and taking money from taking money from all type of industries. I mean, he's from Delaware. So essentially Delaware is is a safe haven for corporations, you know, to uh, basically have them not paying taxes and they have all type of favorable laws for them. I mean, that's where Joe Biden comes from. I mean, he openly admitted that he wanted to prostitute himself to corporations, but they said, come back when you're 40, son. (laughs) He's been over 40 for a while and he definitely took that advice. So the idea that you're going to be able to just propose these things and frame the argument in ways that can persuade them and you think they're going to be persuaded by the fact that we need medicare for all and you know they sat through all those committees in 20 uh, those hearings in 2018 and they heard all those horror stories about the insurance industry and guess what they did after that they kept taking money from the insurance industry and kept opposing medicare for all so it's, it has nothing to do with the argument. Everyone in the country knows we need Medicare for all. Everyone knows it's cheaper. Okay. We got to the point where 70% of Americans support it. 90% of Democrats support it. That's not the issue. The issue is corruption. The issue is pay to play. Right. And so the idea that you're going to be able to do this without forcing them into a tough position and, and actually threatening their power is completely naive. I mean, it's politics 101. And the fact that I know this and people on the left know this and, and, and the news space and progressive media space know this, some people, and they don't, is sad. And it's very telling. And even further, with the $15 minimum wage, 
with the fifteen dollar minimum wage, it turns out it was actually per, uh, Pramila Jayapal who convinced other progressives not to withhold their vote. Let's read it. When a fifteen dollar minimum wage pack, okay. So throughout the process, Jayapal kept in close contact with House and Senate leadership, and her team spoke to the White House legislative affairs staff almost daily. She says. When a $15 minimum wage increase fell out of the package because of Senate rules, that's another bullshit thing, it fell out of the package because Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer didn't want it in there and didn't want to put Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema in an actual position where they'd have to decide on uh, between supporting, you know, a legislation that majority of Americans support and, uh, you know, supporting their donors and their corporate donors. And I mean, there's stories that came out that Joe Manchin himself is going to be profiting off of not having a $15 minimum wage. So that's, you know, just the way this is, this is written is just complete bullshit. Some Democrats considered withholding their votes entirely. Jayapal helped persuade those members to support the deal. And it passed almost entirely along party lines. Progressives have been sort of pushed to the margins so often in politics that I think we may have gotten used to that, Jayapal says. And so people are very inclined to say, oh, this happened again. We didn't get everything we wanted. But she taught her colleagues to realize we should take the win. She taught her colleagues to realize we, under no circumstances, will we fight. Under no circumstances will we withhold our vote. Under no circumstances will we be an oppositional force within this corrupt right-wing party. Under no cir circumstances will we do that. We will take what is given to us. And what is given to us will be, like Pramila Jayapal said, incremental tiny little gains, which don't meet, are so bad and don't meet the moment enough that they really become losses because of the growing wealth inequality that we have in this country. So it's just unbelievable. I mean, I don't I don't I, I don't know what you guys think about this, but for me this was just completely the last straw. I can't go out and tell people to vote for Democrats or support the squad and support progressives if their the strategy that they're employing is diametrically opposed to mine. And to the and what should be the strategy of every working person in this in this country. I, I mean, it's just, I mean, fraud squad. I mean, that's starting to look that's starting to look more and more like the case. I mean, at this point, it seems like it's a hundred percent the case. I, I missed a few. So that that's I missed a few super chats. I'm gonna get back to them in a second. That's that's pretty much you know the gist of that story. Just just incredible. Just incredible. And so I want to go back and look at um, what the the interview she did with Marianne Williamson, because this is when I first started to realize that they don't they don't really have a, a co coherent strategy, an oppositional insurgent strategy, and they will continue to rationalize and rationalize and rationalize away to avoid actually taking responsibility and being confrontational and adversarial towards their own party. So let's, let me connect my headphone. Let me read these super chats real quick before I start that. Colin Radish Carter, appreciate the super chat, man. Hey, Justin, would you be willing to call and rally for a general strike yourself since the fraud squad aren't doing anything. Yeah, 100%. And um, I think Jackson Hinkle is going to be organizing a general strike town hall where we're going to bring on later, labor leaders and, and, and talk about just that. And so I think that's that's willing. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we need to do at this point because it's not, there's not help coming from inside uh, of electoral politics. It's going to take some type of outside movement to actually push the ball forward. It's going to take that. And, you know, do I wish it wasn't the case? Do I wish we, you know, all the time and effort and energy we spent to getting these people into Congress actually was going to bear some real fruit? Of course I do. But I can't ignore all the evidence, you know, and everything that's been going on since Force the Vote and really before that, since, you know, Bernie dropped out of the primary. Fractal, appreciate the uh, super chat again. Thank you for, for thank you for being willing to listen to them. Of course, I'll listen to anybody. <clears throat> yeah, Alyssa, I, I mean, I like diversifying, um, you know, my news intake. I'm doing a lot more research on like economics, the housing market, you know, the Fed. And uh, hopefully I'll be bringing on a guest pr uh, next week, hopefully, or pretty soon, 
who knows a lot more about that, researched that a lot more, um, and, and he can bring shed some light on that to us. So let me let me get this going. Okay. So this was back in January, and this interview was posted. I I don't know when it was conducted, but it was posted right after, um, for like the the House floor the the vote for Nancy Pelosi, the how the vote for House Speaker. So let's see, uh, let's see exactly what. And and by the way, the best question, <laughs> the best interviewer, the person that held, has held her feet to the fire the most of of, of any of the interviewers. That you know of any of the interviews Pramil Jai Paul has done has been Marianne Williamson, who's probably one of the nicest people you ever come across. So let's see what she had to say. Consolidate power. If I hear you correctly, you're talking about the consolidation of power within the party itself, and you're Correct. talking about uh, the fact that the infrastructure has to change, the system has to change. But I haven't heard you say anything about how that's going to happen, and you. Say it has to be nuanced, but how is it even going to happen in a nuanced way? Nothing you've said makes me understand how it's even going to happen in a nuanced way. What's going to change it? These are this is the, these are the Drew, pieces of infrastructure up, I'm talking about. You, too, you can say we want to elect progressives, but if you don't for, have the ability by. to put money into um, finding, recruiting, training, supporting, and bringing along progressives so that they can win. So the, the Cory Bushes and the Jamal Bowmans and the Marie Newmans and all of those people, um, y you're not going to be able to do it. I ran, you might remember, Marianne, in a primary that was a nine-way primary for a seat that had been occupied by a Democrat for 28 years. So there were a lot of people lined up who believed that this was their seat. They were entitled to the seat. I was told not to run. I was told to run for something else. I was told that I wouldn't be able to raise the money I needed to raise. See, it ended up being possible. the most expensive non-swing district race in the country because like California, mm -hmm. we have a top two primary. I ran against somebody who was running on a more uh, you know, centrist, uh, business friendly agenda, a Democrat. And I won. But we've got to be able to do that and change the makeup of Congress. Otherwise, we're not going to have the votes. We don't okay. have the votes right now. And that's, I, that's I, the I, thing I, that people don't understand. That, that's, that's another thing, right? That's another thing that's been parroted that they don't have the votes. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. They have the votes to make a difference. They have the votes to actually say, we're not voting for something until you, Joe Biden, come to the table and give us at least one thing, two things, something we want, a $15 minimum wage, expand Medicare. They have the votes to force that. Pramila Jayapal just told us that they don't want to do that. They don't, they don't want to be an oppositional force. They don't want to be confrontational. They don't want to be adversarial. They want to be propositional. Okay. So that's, that's BS once again. And in, and you know, in the, in the interview with, Ryan Grimm, she once again about forced to vote parroted the fact that it was between Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy. That's another lie. That's another lie. It's not between them. They, she said they didn't want to bring chaos into the House floor uh, before the Electoral College vote. Okay, the Electoral College vote is going to happen regardless. You need to start bringing some chaos because guess who act who's actually getting brought chaos right now? The American people, working people. As all these prices of everything increases and, the, and their wages you know continue to, to flatline as everything else increase so that's who's actually chaos is being brought to so if you could bring some chaos in congress to actually match the urgency and what's going on outside of congress that would be very much appreciated i understand and i have tremendous respect for you and i see everything you're doing you know I, i'm your biggest champion and you said a couple of things just now. You said we have to raise the money for the progressives. You've got Democratic corporatist elite leadership who is actually spending money in race after race to suppress the progressives. <laughs> it's not just a matter of progressives not being able to raise the money. You've got the, your own leadership who's going around saying we don't even want you to run unless you have a lot of money. So you're more likely to get we, money. We, people. We did it anyway. I'm not saying we did it in every single situation, but I'm thinking about the House. You know, we worked in the House. Because last time that happened to us, we had the DTRIP putting money in against progressive candidates 
candidates yeah. like Eastman, uh, like Gina Ortiz Jones, and progressives stood up against that. And those people got close with our help. And this time we were able. What? Why is it? Why is it that progressives never hold grudges? Like, why is that? So if the DCCC is out there spending money against incumbent progressives, which they spent three, four years talking about, oh, uh, you know, we always support incumbents and, you know, we hate when, you know, these insurgent justice Democrat type candidates are going up against incumbents and we don't support that. But then they're doing the same thing against progressive incumbents and they just sit there and take it. In fact, three, four months later, you got AOC bypassing the DCCC and giving money straight to corporate Democrats, straight to corporate Democrats. So why is it that it, it, I mean, this is the essential reason is they don't see their relationship with Nancy Pelosi and, le and the leadership in the House, the Senate and with the president as as any type of adversarial. And I've been saying this for a while. And then Mill Jayapal with this recent interview just came out and proved exactly what I've been saying right. That they don't see that relationship as adversarial. And so they're just going to work with them. They're going to, you know, take what is given and work behind the scenes, not use any of their power. All their power rests in the hands that their agenda that they're pushing is actually supported by a majority of Americans. And they have a huge following, huge popularity. The only power they truly have is the fact that there's a small margin in the House and they have the people power. And they are literally not willing to use either. Like literally, there are two things, there are two levers of power they are not willing to use either. They said they're not gonna they're not gonna withhold any votes, they're not gonna be confrontational, so they're not gonna use the margin, the sm the slim margin. They won't use that, and they're not gonna call for any strikes, they're not gonna call for any protests, they're not gonna call for any rallies, they're not gonna call for shit. They're they're playing an inside game. And I, I wish I could be reporting that progressives like corporate Democrats are going to be standing up and fighting for the issues and withholding their votes until actual progressive redistributive type policies get put into legislation. But they're not going to do that. They're going to let the corporate Democrats do that to get tax cuts for their, their wealthy donors and their rich friends. But they will tweet, like Martin A said, they will tweet. And Ro Khanna will go work a nine to five job one day to bring awareness to the fact that we need a $15 minimum wage. Bruh, you don't need to convince any more people. You really don't. You don't need to convince nobody else, especially nobody who's making under $15 an hour. You don't need to convince us. We know. You need to convince people like Pramila Jayapal and the rest of the members in Congress to actually be willing to do something about it. That's who you need to convince. Everything else is just virtue signaling and you know, playing the game. It's all for show. I, I, prove me wrong, please. Please prove me wrong and get $15 minimum wage to pass and I'll shut my ass up immediately. Poverty porn. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what that is. So I don't want to see no more pass it on tweets. I don't want to see no more what would... Uh, you know, two thousand dollar checks do for you, which we won't fight for. What will fifteen dollar minimum wage do for you? That also we won't fight for. Fifteen dollars an hour would not be a living wage either. Either, but a fan says exactly, and that and I've I'm so glad you brought that up because I've been saying this for a while. The fact that we're sitting here arguing over fifteen dollars an hour, which when I was when I was listening to the Bad Faith podcast and they had those Amazon workers on there. The guy sitting there is like Amazon goes around boasting their $15 minimum wage, $15 an hour, as if we can even survive off that. We're still barely scraping by. That's in Alabama, in Alabama, where they probably have the one of the cheapest standards of living. So how in the hell when 40 over like the thing is 43 percent of workers are working minimum wage jobs, they all have to have second jobs. And you can't have a family on that. So this we're 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 sitting here arguing over fifteen dollars an hour when it needs to be somewhere closer to twenty five to really make a difference. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And un until we start calling this out, until we start withholding our cash and our money and our support, they're going to continue to think that this, you know, this strategy of of you know least resistance. And of just complying with the, the establishment and just, you know, playing patty cake and just suggesting good things and hoping and sending letters 
until we actually do something to stand up against that, they're going to keep doing it. Right. And, and, and it's, we're going to be further and further and further away from actual just society. Able to get them on the DTRIPS uh, list of red to blue candidates. And we were able to get the DTRIP to commit that they wouldn't run against progressive messaging. Did it happen 100% of the time? No, absolutely not. But this is, this is what I'm saying. Like, uh, we actually made some big inroads. I think we progressives just don't know how to even recognize when we get wins or victories. Is that, yes. But if we're going to keep engaging. Please point to one progressive win, like a true win. Something that without progressives there, like without progressives there at all, we wouldn't have had. Please tell me one thing. And I don't want to hear, oh, you know, we got unemployment tax free. Uh, it should have never been taxed in the first place. And that's something the Democratic Party, if they're worth the shit, which they're not, would be supporting anyway. So the standards are all off. The standards are way off. When it comes to our support for progressives in Congress and progressives idea of winning. But they did get right. She, this is this is informative because after this interview, they started calling things wins that weren't wins, like the American Rescue Plan, which didn't even have the bare minimum progressive ask $15 minimum wage in it. People, we have to be able to have a vision of what we're calling people into. And we have to be able to celebrate some of the wins. And, you know, I think about the immigrant women who have been living in the shadows that I've been arrested on the streets of D.C. and Seattle and all across the country, um, you know, pushing for immigration reform. They don't they they are they they need us to also be able to give hope. And so that's I guess, you know, I, I like to come at things from a perspective of ferocity, generous ferocity. Let's put it that way. And um, the ability to really imagine they, 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 they less need us to give them hope. That's what, you know, the Obama <laughs> campaign was about. Hope and change more to give them money money that's what people need people need money to survive what we have done right and to build on it and to be stronger and to flex our muscles and build courage because there's not enough people who have it that's just okay. the reality you do display generous ferocity it's why so many of us absolutely adore you however i you know i've i've counseled people for over 30 years 35 years and when people sit in front of me and they have problems i I always want them to remember what they've done. I mean, it's more, uh, you know, I'm going to stop this. It's more, it's more of the same. I'm, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. Let me catch up on some super chats. I'm done with it. You know, it's, it's old news. I just want to show you guys, you know, where we, we need to start seeing and taking the evidence that we're being shown for what it is and, and stop, you know, living in this ideology that, Things are just going to get better and, you know, progressives are actually going to start realizing that they're going to need to withhold their votes and actually push for stuff. We need to we need to get away from that because that's that's not happening. OK, um, we need to start. We need to organize a general strike, you know, which, like I said, Jackson Hinkle, I think is going to be organizing a general strike town, town hall. Um, you know, I'm going to be bringing on hopefully some uh, and I'm going to cover it a little bit later, but. There's some Amazon. There was an Amazon walkout in Chicago. We need to be supporting stuff like that because that's really what's going to make a change. That's really what's going to make a change, if we're being honest. At least most immediate change, most immediate impact. Fractal, thanks so much again for the super chat. The poverty of power was MLK's Poor People's Campaign. Respecting ballot initiatives, voting rights, union rights, aka the PRO Act. Hashtag force those, vo force those votes. Everything else will come with dem democratized power truth pop reality thanks so much for the super chat these people will lie in your face and then do nothing bro when i say frustrated facts facts that's why i went that's what i was when i when i see people that you know I, like i i was on jackson hinkle show and i told him that i used to go and tell people that weren't that interested in politics but wanted to get into it i used aoc to make like an inroad to make an inroad you know um and give them some type of attachment to a young politician who's pushing for the right things Right. And who's actually telling it how it is. That's what I used to do. So it's very frustrating for me. And I'm sure a lot of other people to have to come out and say, well, now they're defending, uh, you know, their you know, morality policing, you know, uh, whether Biden was worse in the border or Trump, even though we know both are horribly atrocious. And they're saying, oh, I want to be an incremental. We have to be OK with incremental gains and we don't want to be oppositional. So it's it's frustrating for me, too. So I feel you. 
I feel you on that. Fractal, thanks so much again. Wow, coming in heavy with the super chats. I appreciate it, man. Danny Glover, Bernie Sanders, and Progressives gave us the warning in the Eugene B. Debs doc documentary live watch to not rely on them going forward. Damn, I have to cover that. Yo, I want to start doing like, I want to start doing like book, so, like some type of book club or like a documentary where we watch it together. Let me know if y'all would be interested in that. Because I think that'd be really cool. And maybe we could start with that, uh, start with that documentary. Uh, another one, Fractal, uh, Fractal. Thanks again, man. They are dealing with party members who will let people die if they fight back. We have to stop them. Stop the wars. Fight for twenty four dollars. Yeah, I mean, because like, okay, so fifteen dollars is what thirty thousand dollars a year. What is twenty twenty five? Like forty five, fifty thousand, something like that. I mean, that should be bare minimum in this country. That should be bare minimum. That should be the minimum wage. Uh, pop. This is pop reality. Pop reality. Thanks so much for the super chat. Hit the like button. Yes, I always forget to say that. Everyone, make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe. Hit the notification button uh, so you guys know when I drop videos and when I live stream. Yo, Sage and Fool. Wow, thanks so much for the super chat. Appreciate that. $20. You said you're going to pivot to economic info. Please, please, please research Bitcoin. The crypto community is winning. It's space of hope where we know our, our action takes power from the elite. Politics is a dead end money. Yeah. I mean, I am. I have researched Bitcoin a lot. I would love to... Um, I would love to bring on Max Kaiser one of these days or uh, Stacy, his um, co-host. Um, you know, the, pr the, the biggest problem is that, you know, a lot of people just don't have any capital, any extra capital to put into Bitcoin, you know? And so it's like, yes, th that is a way to get away from decentralized currency and decentralized power. There, but there's so many people that don't even have access to it, you know, because they don't have they don't have the means. But I mean, even if even if you do have a little bit, I would definitely suggest investing in that over the stock market, which, you know, is completely inflated, completely socialized. And, you know, eventually that's going to it's going to go down. It's probably going to crash. Max Kaiser doesn't know how the money works, how, doesn't know how money works. I don't know. He was talking about Bitcoin when it was a dollar and now it's 50,000. So. You can say that all you want, but he's uh he's kind of rolling in it right now. Unapologetic, bro. Get Kashama Swan. You're sure? I want I want Kashama Swan on my show. I'm gonna reach out. I think I tried to reach out to her um this weekend, but also my phone was messed up, so the email might not sound. I'm gonna try and reach out again. The analytic failure. Thanks so much for the super chat again. 100% real change will come from protest and direct action, but only if we unite Americans in an anti-partisan manner. The parties only divide us. 100%. 100%. Did you guys see that Charles uh, Barkley interview or that Charles Barkley statement? I almost want, I, I, maybe I'll pull it up. Um, because he's right. He's right. The, I mean, that's what, that's what the parties do. The parties, Democrat, Republican party, they're there to divide us. They're there to divide us. They're there to say, oh, it's that person's fault or it's this group's fault or that group's fault. Um, all while the corporations and all the wealthy people sneak out the back door with all the money. So, Justin, are you MMT wise? I'm not MMT wise, if I know exactly what you mean, but I do want to bring on someone like Stephanie Kelton to talk about it because I want to learn more about it. And I think we all should. Um, I mean, stocks go up and down. Good speculation doesn't make you a profit. Fractal, again, man, you coming in with a super chat today. Sheesh. U.S. domestic policy, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. U.S. foreign policy, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Yeah. And I've heard a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people talk about how what we do overseas, we then bring home. So when we over militarize and occupy other countries, you know, with a militarized force, what do you do? Oh, well, there's all these extra money. There's all this extra money and there's all, all, all these extra weapons and gear and tactical, all this shit. And so then they bring it here and then you see it on the streets, you know, in our own population. So what we do overseas 100% gets translated back here. And it's all because of values, right? So if you're if you if you have values that say, "Oh, I can go to another country and illegally occupy them and bomb them, kill them, and pose sanctions," then those same people and those same values are the, the ones governing us here. So why would they not do that when there's something that they want to suppress or oppress or there's some type of dissent that they don't want you to hear? Right? We talk so much, talk so much about, you know, how China 
um, you know, has their search engine that is, uh, you know, restricted and all that type of stuff. But I mean, everything here, it, they do the same thing. It's just in a different fashion, in a different light, which makes us feel like we have a veneer of freedom, right? But if the truth is actually on Google's 50th page and, and, and all the bullshit propaganda is on the, on the first page of a Google search, then is that not effectively the same thing? Purple, purple philosophy. Appreciate the super chat, man. Thanks, bro. Great show. Thanks, man. We're not done. We're still going. We're still going. Um, let's let's jump into our next um, let's jump into our next story. Uh, let's talk about the union because I know a lot of people were bringing that up. Um, so everyone, if you don't know, there was an Amazon. There was an Amazon union drive in Bess Bessemer, Alabama, where the Amazon workers that were trying to form a union. Now we've covered this, so you can go watch my old, uh, my you know old videos about it. But it's been going on for probably a little over a month. Um, and Amazon is doing everything under the sun, everything under the sun to prevent this union from actually happening. You know, they used to be they used to like right outside of the facility. There's a stoplight where they were trying to organize. The, you know, the union organizers were trying to get people, give people information and talk to them when there was a red light. They literally talked to the city to make sure the light was like pretty much green all the time. So they couldn't talk to those people anymore. They instituted a random mailbox that had never been there, um, which, you know, we'll talk about more later because that's important um, and told them, oh, y'all can drop off your votes here. It was instituted by Amazon. They worked with USPS to get that instituted. They would bombard them with text messages all day talking about how unions are bad and they're going to steal your money and union dudes are going to, uh, you know, steal your money, be so bad for you. You're actually going to make less money, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I mean, they were just doing everything under the sun to make sure that this this thing didn't pass. And unfortunately, it did not. It did not pass. Let me pull it up. This is from Politico. Oh, hold on. Let me get it again. Okay. Union defeat at Amazon warehouse turn spotlight to the hill. Um, the battle over organized labor's clout will be focused more squarely on Capitol Hill now that workers at an Amazon warehouse in Alabama have soundly defeated an effort to form a union there. Um, let's get to the vote. You know, they're talking about the PRO Act, which... Apparently, Biden did put that in his infrastructure legislation. Now, whether that'll stay in there, you know, probably not. Um, but we'll see. The PRO Act is protecting the right to organize, act, and return and return workers in Alabama, Michigan, and all corners of this land to their rightful place as drivers of broadly shared prosperity that represent America as best. Andy Levin, Democrat from Michigan, said, well, are you going to be willing to not vote for this package unless it's in there? Otherwise, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> at this point that's how that's the energy we have to come at this shit with um the vote was so yeah president biden did include that in the two trillion dollar infrastructure plan um so here's the vote but workers at the fulfillment center in bessemer voted 1798 so 1798 to 738 against joining the union nearly six thousand workers were eligible and roughly more than half cast ballots the union says it plans to challenge the result and ask the nlrb to consider settling the vote setting the vote aside alleging amazon created an atmosphere that interfered with the employment employee, employees freedom of choice so you know alleging I, I don't think i don't think it's they're alleging that all the evidence that has been borne out in multiple reports so that they did create that atmosphere 100 percent. they had i mean even in the bathroom stalls where people barely get 20 30 People have been fired for going to the bathroom. There have been reports, Amazon workers saying they're fired going to the bathroom. Even when they get a little bit reprised from this horrible, horrible work environment where they're overworked, it's hot, um, they're expected to have un unbelievable amounts of quotas, et cetera, et cetera. They have shit in the bathrooms saying, oh, don't vote no on the union. Vote no on the union. Like even when they're peeing, they can't even get a break from Amazon when they're peeing. So like, that's you know that's the type of shit that amazon did the, the the vote did um did fail the vote did fail but 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 apparently let me find it and then i got this from a more perfect union they say all hope is not lost yet more perfect union says 
breaking, more Perfect Union has obtained new details about Amazon's illegal actions to defeat the union. The violations make it overwhelmingly likely that the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, will overturn the results and give workers a second election. Details in the video and thread below. Um, that's a long video, so we'll skip the video. But they say we've learned that at least 20% of the ele election votes are believed to have come from the illegal ballot draw box that Amazon installed at its warehouse. So I think this might have been what we were talking about as far as like the uh, little drop, the drop box, mail box type thing that they got installed. These ballots arrived at the NLRB in large batches on February 12th and 17th, according to the sources with knowledge of the election, which is crazy. Wow. Has it been going on for two months? So, yeah, I mean apparently like at least 20 percent of these votes came from this illegal ballot drop box because it's just so hard for me to believe and I, and you guys correct me if i'm wrong but it's so hard for me to believe that this election went this poorly you know with all the attention that was on it all you know the media attention you know all these uh members of congress going like they had to feel so supportive so I, that vote i mean it's not it wasn't even close so i don't know i don't know about that um let's see as a result a substantial portion of the total. Oh, oh, let me let me make it bigger for you guys. As a result, a substantial portion of the total election votes are linked to Amazon's unlawful actions that the NLRB specifically directed the company not to take. Of course, they didn't listen because they don't care. Multi-trillion dollar company. They feel like they could do whatever the fuck they want. In an exclusive interview, our, our WDSU, which is uh, the union that um, that they were that was trying to join, attorney. Richard Drauco also said that the union obtained communications in which Amazon management essentially threatened that there would be a layoff because of the union. He describes it as a hallmark violation of the Labor Relations Act. Of course, and we're going to get to another story or an, uh, another part of the story after this where this exact thing did happen. But they, they threatened this. They threatened layoffs. And sometimes they even threat, threatened closing down the whole facility. This is how much they don't want a union formed. They're willing to just scrap the entire um, facility sometimes to make sure that you don't get a union, that you can't make three, four, five more dollars an hour and actually have benefits. When they're making, when they're a multi trillion dollar company and the owner of that company uh, is the richest man in the world. Like, this is not a sustainable system. <laughs> this is not a sustainable system. And you know what this system is ensuring in the future is a violent revolution. It is. And so when FDR saved capitalism, right, is what which is what he said, um, you can't save it that long because now we see it's run rampant. It's completely unfettered, completely uncontrolled. Um, the corp it's a corporate state. The corporations own the government um, because they own the politicians who run the government. <laughs> so it, it's not sustainable. It's, it's completely not sustainable. They say uh, our report documents other ways that Amazon ran a coordinated attack on the worker-led union effort, including managers photoshopping the badge of workers who were sympathetic to the union. That's nuts. I did not know that. Photoshopping the badges. Wow. Photographing, not photoshopping. Photographing the badges of workers who were sympathetic to the union. Indicating to workers in writing that the election ended on March 1st. It ended on March 29th. Just, I mean, every dirty trick in the book. Amazon may still have won the union vote if it played fair and square, but it did not. Amazon engaged in a campaign of intimidation and coercion that violated the rules. As a result, the NLRB is likely to disqualify this result and grant a new election. So, you know, we'll, we'll, I'll keep you updated on that. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but I'm definitely going to I'm definitely going to keep you all updated on that. And there was another. Something I came across on Twitter, which I was really excited to see. And, I, and like I said earlier, this is something that we're going to have to be doing more of because there's not a lot of help, if any coming from you know inside of congress so let me find that of course now i can't hold on give me one sec oh here we go no that's not it okay so check this out our walkout yesterday is just getting started. So this is Amazonians United Chicago. So shout out to the hometown. Shout out to the hometown. This makes me proud. This makes me really proud. Our walkout yesterday is, is us just getting started. Here's why we did it and why we're going to keep making Amazon sweat. Yo, go crazy. Go crazy. Keep making Amazon sweat. Because 
like we saw, you know, like we saw what happened with in Bessemer, Alabama, they'll do anything under the sun to ensure that they, you know, continue to make massive amounts of wealth, um, continue to make Jeff Bezos and all the executives there extremely wealthy at the expense of the people that are actually busting their ass every single day um, to produce that that wealth and that, and that labor. So here they say it's been six months of this inhumane 120 a.m. to 1150 a.m. mega cycle shift. Constant speed up and disrespect for management. We have so many stories of our lives being disrupted by Amazon's national change to the mega cycle. So many mothers now struggling to care for their families. So many of us waking up feeling like zombies every day after just a short little nap, pushing ourselves to keep working this shift out of necessity. Today, we got fed up and walked out demanding mega cycle shift schedule accommodations for people who need it. Lift rides to and from work, a $2 night shift differential instead of the week 50 cents that so they're giving them 50 cents extra an hour and they're only asking for two like it's not even a, a big ask at all and respect for our full 20 minute paid break which is still like not even enough time all these corporate jobs get 30 minutes to an hour for a break they only get a 20 minute 20 minute break and and it's so uh, apparently they're not even getting the full break a lot of times they get called back early they say we are proud that most workers walked out today. Less than ten stayed working. Come on, if you're those ten, don't don't be those ten. Okay, D don't do that. Some joined our rally for a bit. Some went home right away. But all of us were busting up, <laughs> busting up laughing because by walking out, we put all the managers to work. Yeah, I love that. Y'all know Amazon is always spying on us. They know we were getting fed up, so they brought new managers in from all over today. Maybe they wanted to scare us. All we know is we made all of them sweat today. It's probably the first time they've ever worked. I mean, this is still low-level management. It's not even like the executives. This is low-level low, low level management. They don't even freaking work, you know? <sighs> our walkout today is, is us just getting started. Amazon thought they'd get rid of our union by shutting DCH1 down. So apparently, there I have to do more research on that. There might have been a drive, Amazon drive, uh, union drive at DCH1, another warehouse, um, and they, mu they must have shut it down. And so they thought they'd scare them with that. But nope, all they did was piss us off even more and help us spread from being at one location and now growing our union at multiple Chicago land sites. Yeah, shout out to the hometown. Much appreciation for our community who came out and rally in support of our walkout and to all our fellow workers watching. Join the struggle. Get it started at your site. Yo, that is badass. That is badass. That's the type of shit in leadership we need. That is badass. And you know what else we need? We need like some type of database where we can keep track of this. Keep track of when these type of things are happening because I want to highlight this stuff. And if I'm in the area or someone else is in the area, I can let people know who are in the area um, that this is going to happen. And if and if we can, you know, know what's going to happen in advance, you know, we can plan for it. So we need some type of database to track that stuff. But, you know, that's so that's a silver lining, I guess. Um, you know, something that good that's happening. And maybe these people, these Amazon workers in Chicago saw what was happening in Bessemer, Alabama. And they're like, okay, we can do this shit too. And, and where did, you know, personally, this is what I say. I'm not exactly sure if this is the case, but I think the, the workers in Bess Bessemer, Alabama, um, got energized because of stuff like what Christian Smalls did in 2020, staging, hit, staging a walkout with, uh, all his workers. He was a supervisor. So with all the people that were working under him, he staged a walkout because, you know, they had un, uh, a, a very unhealthy workspace where a lot of people were getting sick. They weren't telling people. Um, so I think that that was kind of the start of, of that energy, you know. So even if potentially, you know, Bessemer, Alabama doesn't work out. Well, now we have more of it popping up in Chicago. And if it keeps pop popping up in pockets around the country, well, they can't fight all of it. They can't. You know, they're going to try. But that's the type of energy we need moving forward. That's the type of um, solidarity we need moving forward. So solidarity with everyone in Chicago, the Amazon workers in Chicago land, walking out of the facility and saying, fuck that. We want more money. We want a two, we want respect for you know us as workers. We want a two dollar raise for this crazy mega cycle night shift. You wonder how you get uh, you know, um one day shipping. It's because there's people waking up, mothers waking up at 1.20 a.m. to work a 10-hour mega cycle shift and getting paid 50 cents extra for that. Because I, I, I thought overtime, you know, when you're working outside of the normal work hours, 
for most other companies is time and a half. But they're not getting uh twenty two uh twenty two dollars and fifty cents, which would which would be time and a half of fifteen dollars an hour. They're getting fifteen dollars and fifteen fifty cents. Now tell me how that's fair. Now tell me how that's equitable. Because if you're working a corporate job and you you work overtime and you work some crazy hour like that or 10 hour shift, which is also overtime, you actually get time and a half. So I want to have Chris Smalls on the show again to talk about this. That's my guy. Um, And like I said, I think what he did was so courageous and it really sparks stuff like, you know, what's happening in Chicago, what was happening in, 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 in Bessemer, Alabama. And hopefully, um, you know, they do invalidate that bullshit result because there was so much intimidation going on. There was so much misinformation and disinformation that I don't hear, you know, uh, all the, you know, all the, the Democrats in Congress being up in arms about the misinformation and disinformation that was spewed by Amazon constantly and, and asking for some type of someone to do something about it or, uh, you know, some type of asking any of the executives over um, at Amazon or at that site to resign. I don't hear any of that, even though they should be. You know, um, and whether the PRO Act passes, which would hopefully, you know, prevent something like this from happening again. I don't see any, you know, I, all I hear is from the Paul saying they're not going to be oppositional. They're not going to be confrontational. Well, Joe Biden, you know, is signaling support to that. But Joe Manchin's out here saying he's not going to support none unless they got Republican uh, support It's bipartisan. So no Republicans going to support that. So if you actually want to prevent stuff like this from happening, you actually want the PRO Act to pass, well, I'm going to need to start seeing some, uh, you know, you walk the walk. You're talking the talk, but I'm going to need you to see you start walking the walk. So let me catch, uh, watch It's a Small World on YouTube. Yeah, everyone, make sure you go subscribe to It's a Small's World on YouTube. That's Christian Small's YouTube show. Um, I know he does it with Blakely. And he, like I said earlier, he was the, Amazon supervisor that staged a walkout in uh, 2020 and ended up getting fired for because of it. Ended up getting fired and losing his job in the middle of a pandemic. But it's because he had the the courage. He had the courage to to do that, and it was and it was necessary. So you know, I applaud him. That's what we, that's what we're gonna have to do. You have to have the courage to to stand up, speak out, talk you know, talk about what's actually going on. Catherine Good said, said, we got to start swinging our balls. That's facts. That's facts. <laughs> Demand ownership of the company. We need to stop identifying people with their jobs. Truth. Truth. All right, let me catch up on these super chats. I don't want to miss any. I really appreciate everyone. Fractal, again, yo, you, you've been coming in clutch, bro, with the super chats. Gender, sex, sexual, reproductive justice requires racial and labor justice racial and labor justice requires environmental and foreign policy justice it's all it's all connected you're right fractal it's all connected it's all connected jameson doan appreciate the super chat justin can i please dm you i work for a crypto nft firm um yeah probably on twitter like at me on twitter or something or dm me on instagram sage and fool appreciate the super chat again coming from canada the canadian dollars Canada, how is Canada? I, I, I want to visit Canada. I'm sure Canada is like similar to the U.S. politically, but just less extreme, you know? Like I know uh, Trudeau is like a neoliberal, you know? He also has all these pictures of him in like, like culturally appropriating everything, <laughs> including uh, a, a picture of him um, in blackface, <laughs> which, you know, he's still the, he's still the, prime minister or whatever it's called so that, that apparently didn't get him canceled sage and fool says for how many decades will people keep up the insanity of trying to change the system through politics truth the money is where the power lies control the money control the power opt out of the system bitcoin okay you sound a lot like Mac, max kaiser and, and i like that and i think you know if you do a lot of research on bitcoin and the fact that it's decentralized can't be controlled through any of these central banks i think if you have if you have any extra capital you know, and you're looking to invest, I would probably pick that. I would probably pick that because I think as <laughs> people start to realize that these central banks and it's in, in, every, in all of the money supply being controlled by, you know, these wealthy people, like people just trust the Fed, right? We just trust, I mean, not, not us, right? But normal people just trust the Fed, but who is the Fed? The Fed is just made up 
of people like Janet Yellen and people that have been, you know, in these high places, work for, uh, you know, banks and all type of stuff. That's that's all it is. They're just an institution that's run by people, and those decisions are made by people, right? So, I I wouldn't I wouldn't trust I wouldn't trust that. And the fact that Bitcoin, you know, is decentralized, it can't be manipulated, can't be controlled. You know, there are you know a lot of countries have literally outright said we're going to ban it. It's people are still buying it. They can't control that. I think that's something that people should definitely definitely look into. Jackson in the chat. We need a Justin Jackson NFT. Would that go crazy? <laughs> Would that like I just learned about NFTs from uh the Bad Faith podcast episode about it, but I need to do a lot more research. But that's just crazy. <laughs> I think I saw uh Tom Brady la launch like an NFT. The takeover, you are welcome in the Netherlands. Bet yeah, I want to go check out the Netherlands. The Dutch, right? That's the Dutch. Don't they have free healthcare in Canada? They do, they do have free healthcare in Canada. We don't have that here, so. Um, definitely already in that sense, better than the United States. Come to Canada. We are neo-lib and pretty awful. <laughs> nice. We love that. <laughs> Our government is neo-lib and pretty awful. That's to say, you know, it's, it's frustrating because there's so many great, I mean, amazing people here in America. I mean, we're just completely run by neocon war hawks, um, and rich oligarchs who could literally care less about anyone's lives as long as they can make another billion dollars after they already have five, 10, and 15 billion dollars. Um, money you just could not spend in multiple lifetimes. The I think Jamie Dimon, the the uh CEO of, of Chase, JP Morgan Chase is literally a billionaire. The CEO of a bank is a billionaire. Do you not understand that our money is being stolen from us? Just completely stolen. Completely stolen. All right. Um, let me get back to the sorry, let me get back to the super chats. Um Fractal again, yo, Fractal, you are going crazy. You're going crazy in the super chats. I'm just gonna let you know you're going crazy. Okay, what happened to Breonna Taylor and George Floyd is what the U.S. government does to foreign countries in our name. Sadly, hundred percent true, hundred percent true. Hashtag end the wars and fight for twenty four, not for fifteen. Yo, facts, brother, facts. And sorry, I don't want to assume your gender either. So I don't know if Fractal is. I appreciate you. Let me just say that, uh, Peter. Ayo, thanks for the super chat. 20 bucks. Man, y'all are going crazy today. Winning is better than losing, but even a losing fight creates possibilities that wouldn't exist otherwise. Exactly. The fight itself lifts, lifts the consciousness of the working class and helps us realize our power. Exactly. That's exactly true. Thank you for saying that. And we let's use the example. You know, there's mal, there's so many examples, right? Like, I mean, civil rights movement, gay rights movement, women's suffrage movement. They lost before they won. And we have a situation now where Pramila Jayapal is going out there and saying, I don't want to vote if it's not going to pass. What? Like, what do you mean? You don't you don't want to vote if it's not going to pass? The vote itself is important because it advances the agenda. Right. And look at something like Christian Small. You can say he lost. He lost his job. But then what does that spark? Amazon or, or uh, Bessemer, Alabama trying to unionize. Right. And even if they lose, what does that spark? Chicago try, trying to uh, unionize. That's how it works. You have to fight. You have to fight. And being from sports, I know this. I understand this. You can't be afraid to lose. You can't be afraid to, to um, you know, throw a move or take a risk, right? You can't be afraid of that. If you're afraid of that, they, you know, this is what my, co my college coach used to call it. Paralysis by analysis. Paralysis by analysis. If you're not actually going out there and fighting, playing loose, feeling loose, and actually just going in there with your conviction, you've already lost the game. You've already lost. You have to commit. You have to go. Do the, progressive, do the progressives even talk to each other? Do they even understand how much power they have, how much popularity that they have within the country? And that's why it's fucking sad. That's why it's sad. Because we're all behind them. If they actually went out there and did it and started fighting and started withholding votes, we're all behind them. But then they want to say, oh, we have to organize more. We have to do more. Why don't y'all do more? Because just compromising away all your values is bullshit and we see right through it. And we see right through it. 
and it's just it's it's enraging because we're at a point in this country where it's at a fever pitch. You can't just keep going through all these crises, all these economic meltdowns, and think you're just gonna print all this money, which ends up going to who? Where does all that money printing go? Go one point nine trillion dollars. How much? How much of that are working people seeing? Two over two trillion dollars in the CARES Act. How much of that do working people see? Even with the infrastructure bill, it's going to create jobs. Is it going to create enough jobs? No. Is it? And it's not. And and with and with this with the infrastructure bill, it's going to be seen, but it's going to be seen indirectly. That's okay. But you need to actually put and invest the actual true amount of money to get that out on the back end. And so you can't just keep having all these trillions of dollars being printed and it's continuously and continuously going to who? The rich and the wealthy. That's that um, story that Rising and Crystal and Sagar did about that broken down, dilapidated shack that was already worth $250,000. I don't know how, but then it was paid for $500,000 cash money. Who do you think is who do you think's buying that? A middle class family? Even an upper middle class family dropped on 500K? almost double of what the asking price was? Of course not. It's a hedge fund billionaire. So even the people in the, this is how the, the wealth is stolen from people in the middle class. They've, they've already done so much to steal money from the working class. And it's capitalism, baby. They got to keep making more money. So they're going to start stealing it from who now? The middle class. And that's why the middle class has been getting squeezed out further and further and further for decades now. Completely loot, completely looted. Okay, like Algebus says, just trickle up. It's loot, looted. So they're already taking money, right? They're already stealing money from people, working people, lower middle class, middle middle class. All you know, all these different labels that don't mean anything because we're all the working class, <laughs> right? We're all working for someone. We don't own things. It's being taken from us, and it's being trickled up right to billionaires who are making more and more and more money. Do you think it's sustainable to have over 650 billionaires just making 80 billion, 90 billion, 100 billion dollars in a year, in a in a week, in a month? That's not sustainable. We're set we're we're setting the foundation for this empire to collapse, to fall, and it's already it's already happening. We're already getting our ass whipped economically by China and by you know, by people that are actually investing in the future of their of their of their country, you can't just keep spending eight hundred billion dollars on the mil on the military year after year after year after year, and it's more than that because there's over a trillion. You know that there's money that's not accounted for in, in the public budget. You can't just keep doing that year after year after year after year and expect nothing to happen. Not sustainable. It's falling, but it is. It is. Sorry, I don't even know where Peter I on. Thank. I went on a tangent, Peter. But thanks for the super chat, man. I appreciate it. Fractal, again with the super chat, you're going crazy. I almost want to tell you to stop. But I, I I do appreciate it though. We must frame everything in the concept of freedom. Truth. I pay taxes to be free. Good system. Then then get paid a middle class tax break to be enslaved. It only takes one medical issue to lose it all. And I've said this so I've said this so many times. I'm glad you brought that up. Can you imagine? Can you imagine working your entire life? And I'm sure there's probably some people in the chat that can't imagine it because it happened to them. You're working your whole life, nine to five, working your ass off, taking, you know, buying a home, taking risks, right? Because this is how they told you to build wealth, going to college, accumulating debt. You randomly get sick, even if you have health insurance. It's capped at some, or they decide they just don't want to cover you. You know, you've been paying money to them for months, years, decades. All of a sudden, they just like, ah, eh, fuck it. We're not gonna, we're not gonna cover you. You're on your own, and you lose everything. Everything you've worked for your entire life, gone because of a medical issue. That, like that, to me, like that hurts my heart that people have to go through that. And in in this country, that's the reality that people have to face. And, and, and tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, I think it's 500,000 people every single year, 500,000 people every single year. So like the amount of people that have died from COVID, that same amount of people, a little bit less at this point, 
every single year in this country in a normal year where we don't have a pandemic or a crisis that that we call out right because 500,000 people going bankrupt from medical bills is a crisis every single year we don't we don't we don't look at that and say that's horrifying that needs to be remedied we just accept that these politicians who are getting paid off by the same people that are actually the death panels for people that actually say, nah, we're just not going to cover that or this or this organ or that one. Um, you're on your own. And then the people go, and then 40 to 60,000 people every single year die. Their life ends simply because instead of living in a country like Canada or living in a country like Germany or like Australia, they were born in this country and they got sick. And now they have to take out a second mortgage or they just simply can't afford it and they die, a preventable death. Tell me how that's not so insanely evil. And the fact that we go every single day and actually allow that to happen and actually accept that as some type of rational society is nuts to me. It's nuts to me. My dad is from Detroit. Detroit borders Canada. You live in Detroit. You have a you have diabetes and you can't afford your insulin. And you're you're rationing your insulin. You go ten minutes across a bridge. You have that same scenario and you're fine. You will have all the insulin you need and you won't go broke because of it. How much more do we need to get people to wake up? And now, like Catherine's saying, I'm terrified of getting COVID and going bankrupt. Now we're gonna have millions of more people who have a pre-existing condition who are now going to be needing, you know, there's a lot of evidence that there's a lot of uh, side effects from having COVID. They're going to also be needing to get booster shots because the vaccine Pfizer said only lasts six months. And, oh, and on top of that, they said they're going to jack up the prices. They're going to jack up the prices for the vaccine. Who's going to pay for that? Well, first it's going to be the insurance companies. <laughs> but don't kid yourself. Do not kid yourself. They will not incur those costs. No, 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 no. They will not incur those costs because they're, they operate under capitalism and they need more and more and more and billions and billions and billions of dollars more. So who's going to actually incur those costs? You are. You, the, the regular person who's still working on $7.25 an hour, even if you're working on $15, $16, $17, $18 an hour, you are going to be left with the costs of getting a booster vaccine every, what, six to nine months, probably. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And, and, and it's, it's hard to live under this system and not literally go insane, go crazy. Sometimes I feel like I am. All right, let me catch up on the rest of these Super Chats, and then we'll jump into our next uh, next story. Give me one second. Pull this up. Give me one sec. It's bugging out on me. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, Giorgio Mosqueda, thanks so much for the super chat. Take control of the money, bring democracies into every workplace. One worker, one vote. Truth. Truth. Fractal, again, yo, you're going crazy. I, I, I don't even know what to say anymore. You're, you're just going crazy. Respect can't be coerced or negotiated. Dr. Cornell West. Even the squad can hurt people. No relationship with progressives should require ass kissing. Yeah, and I'm done with it. I know all of us are done with it. Because at the end of the day, you know, we supported them because we supported the, their agenda and we supported, um, you know, to we, we are their support for pushing these things through. But if they're not willing and able to actually um, commit to doing that, then I'm sorry, I can't support you anymore. And I'm not going to kiss your ass because at the end of the day, I understand you are a politician. You're just a person. I will not put you on a pedestal. I don't care if your name is Bernie Sanders, AOC, Rashid Sleep. I don't care. I don't think people should put me on a pedestal. I'm just a person. So there's no way I'm going to go out and put a politician on a pedestal, especially when I know they literally have the power within their hands to actually do something to help the people that I see struggling all the time that I then feel like I have to go out of my way and help them, which I'm glad to do. But I can only affect and help so many people. I don't have 
I don't have the capital and the freaking backing of the U.S. government to actually put pieces in a legislation that could affect millions, hundreds of millions of people all at once. Okay. Um, Brian Frederick, appreciate the super chat. Thoughts on the shooting in Rock Hill, South Carolina? Was that the was that the one uh, with the former NFL player? That shit was sad, bro. Like th that. <sighs> One, I mean, just the, we're having like a mass shooting every single day. Like, I don't, I, there probably hasn't been one today, but um, there was two. There was two yesterday. I think it was that one, if that's the one you're talking about, and then the one in like Bryan, Texas. But I mean, I don't know. I, I don't want to speculate and say it was CTE. I mean, obviously, that's the first thing that's going to be on a lot of people's minds. Um, and that's definitely a possibility, 100%. I don't want to 100% say it is that, you know. Um, he could have just had other issues. I don't know. But it's, it's messed up. It's messed up. And, yeah, there was one in Texas where one person got killed, four or five people got injured. Just unbelievable. Like, we, we just – this doesn't happen in other countries. Do we understand that mentally we are a completely broken society? Completely broken. And, oh, also in our culture, it's bad to go seek help. It's bad to go to see a therapist. It's stigmatized, especially if you're a man, especially if you're a black man or a person of color, to go and seek help for your mental health. Even though we're <laughs> exposed to trauma day in and day out in this country, whether it's seeing people living in tents under every bridge, whether it's seeing mass shootings happen every day, whether it's knowing people that are, are broke or going broke because of something that was out of their control, seeing people get laid off, can't find another job. like. Everything you see is traumatic in this country if you actually internalize that stuff. Or you just ignore it, which is what a lot of people, you know, do. But, I mean, that stuff festers, you know. You can't just let that. It, it, it's a disease. It's a disease, and you can't just let it fester or will completely consume your entire body. And that's what's happened in this country. That's what's happened in this country. Okay, let me let's jump into another story. Let's jump into another story. Um, I wanted to cover. Did you guys see Dan Crenshaw on Joe Rogan? I want to cover that because th th this is the type of crazy, like competent type of Trump that I think we should be fearful of. I think we should definitely be fearful of someone like Dan Crenshaw because. When he talks, I mean, he's a crazy right wing nut, but when he talks, he doesn't sound as crazy as like someone like Trump, right? So let's pull that up and we'll go through it together. All right. So Dan Crenshaw's problem with stimulus check. This is just short, short clip, seven minute clip. We'll go that moment is special because there's value in suffering. And in today's society, we have convinced ourselves right, there is no value in suffering, that the entire role of state government is to end your suffering. But this Rogan experience. But that moment is special because there's value in suffering. And in today's society, we have convinced ourselves that there is no value in suffering, that the entire role of state government is to end your suffering. But this is a false promise. Not only is it a false promise, but it will, it will create a weak society that is unable to sustain itself. I mean, he already started off saying there's <laughs> there's value in suffering. <laughs> like, bruh, are, are you serious? Yeah, there's value in suffering, not suffering of me or people in my family, because we've always had it fine, you know, and I, you know, he I think he went to Iraq or Afghanistan or something, came back, lauded as a hero. I mean, he, he went over there, you know. I, I don't know what his previous volition was when it came to U.S. foreign policy, but let's be honest, you know, you're just a cog for the American empire at, at a point. And, and you inflicted a lot of suffering, I'm, I'm guessing, and I'm pretty sure, and we have as a country, on a lot of other populations. So I would say there, there's not a whole lot of value in suffering. In fact, what we should do and should push for an irrational society is to alleviate all suffering when possible, which we can do in this country with the resources we have. But because of you, people like you, Dan Crenshaw, and your party and the Democratic Party and just politicians and the system in general, there's a lot of suffering. And you want people to find value in that? You must not have, uh, you know, been completely impoverished 
um, with no way out uh, or know anyone like that in your life. It's a really important point. And I think there's I think there's deep truth in that. This is why victimhood politics is so dangerous. And I would say populism is, too. I, 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 I think the two are almost indistinguishable from each other. People are always trying to talk about populism on the right and the left. And I say, look, well, here's what populism is. It's telling you what you feel. It's mirroring your feelings back to you, it's telling you what you want to hear as opposed to the truth. So that, I, I think that's a decent. Yo, that that is this is why I always say it's projection, because that is exactly what our our current system does, whether you're on the right or on the left. Right. It tell they tell you what you want to hear. The right has a huge victimhood complex with complex which they never want to talk about right um and so it's actually he's projecting that because that's what our current system does i want to run that back i want to run that back feelings back to you telling you what you want to hear as opposed to the truth that that's literally what our system I, does i think that's, that's a what decent our definition of populism i don't no, no no that's that's a decent de definition of the capitalist system that we have in this country the 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 capitalist democracy that we have in this country <laughs> so it's just a, of course it's the complete opposite of what he's saying like it i don't like people embracing it um it, it doesn't just mean hey things that are good that people are for well you know what a lot of people are for 1600 hundred dollar checks that are free <laughs> that doesn't mean it's a good policy right that's a good example right. of people populism. voted if they voted and said do you want a hundred thousand dollars yeah, for a year totally everybody would vote yes yeah why wouldn't you yeah, but, is, so, but is it but that's just such a bullshit framing of that argument people wanted that money because they were literally struggling and can't pay their rents because the system that we live under had them living paycheck to paycheck even though they're working their ass off every single day that's why the people wanted the checks like just the complete opposite it, it of what they're saying policy and of course right, not of course not um and the, the kind of amounts to the to the i think drastic lurches and you know, welfare policy or infrastructure spending and all of these things that, that we're seeing. It's populism on steroids. It's telling you what you want to hear. So he doesn't want and any infrastructure not... spending. He doesn't want any spending at all. No investment in, in the human and physical capital of this country. But he's OK with spending hundreds of billions of dollars on war. I'm sure he's OK with that. Um, and he never talks about the free money that we give to banks, the free money that we give to um corporations in, in the form of tax cuts and tax literally tax rebates the free money you give uh, you know in form of tax cuts to super uber wealthy people the free money that doesn't get taxed because you put in a tax haven somewhere overseas they never talk about any of this stuff but once people are you know need a one-time sixteen hundred dollar check all of a sudden he's up in arms like this is a joke like if you listen to this shit and you actually think it's it's rational at all or you know it's coherent i'm sorry but i've got a bridge to sell you truth it's not truth and we have to get back to truth and we have to get away from this victimhood mentality where we actually we actually elevate this idea of being helpless See, that's what's changed that's what's changed in the last decade it used to be that well you you might feel some shame if you were the type to you know what you know what i just i, I need some help i feel bad about it i'm gonna get back on my feet but i need some help right now that used to be the sort of American way, right? We, we need a safety net. That's, yeah. Nobody would disagree with that. We, we need a safety net. We that's, need to help people who have truly fallen on our time. That's literally not true. The Republican Party does everything it can to get rid of the safety net. This dude is dumb as hell. He doesn't even know what his own party fights for at every single turn. Cuts to Medicare. Cuts to Social Security. Cuts to Medicaid. Cuts to education, cuts to anything that helps normal people, raise the military budget, get more tax cuts in there, get more money to corporations <laughs> who lost their jobs because of COVID. But does that also mean we need to provide a $1,400 check to somebody who never lost their job and whose biggest hardship has been Zoom meetings? Of course not. But over 100 million people completely were disconnected from society. Jobs. 100 million? Easily. It's, completely it's, it's way more it's way more than that I, i'm i'm cutting it off at 100 million so Hold on, explain checked. that to me hold up well, i want to i don't know how much of that is true he's saying 100 million people got it who didn't who got a check got a check who never lost their job i think that needs to be fact checked but when we when we send out and their biggest hardship was zoom meetings like have you even met anyone living making seventy thousand eighty thousand dollars but 
to do that and to get that entry level wage or even to work your way up to that, you had to incur tens of thousands, if not uh, over a hundred thousand dollars in debt. It's not like you're just getting this money, uh, seventy thousand dollars, and all of a sudden you're super uber wealthy. Not to mention the fact that almost half of it in certain places probably goes to rent. Like these people are it. These people are idiots. Like, and I like Joe Rogan. I think he. I mean, he was a Bernie supporter. Um, I think he has a lot of great points. But, I mean, you didn't do research on the stimulus bill. <laughs> like, come on. Chat. You're gonna let him direct just say payment. this bullshit on here? But maybe he. Maybe, maybe he comes back at him later. Direct cash payments. So th these the COVID stimulus checks. Yeah. So because they go out to anybody who makes those checks that didn't lose their jobs. Of course. What? Yeah, if you, the, the cutoff was like seventy. <laughs> Why is that so hard year. to believe? So that means wait a minute, wait a minute. That means every federal, well, not every, so but a lot of federal workers getting them too. So people didn't lose any money because of the pandemic still got checks. Yeah, these were never these were never based on your situation. What? Yeah, really? It's ridiculous. Well, it, I didn't know it, that. Yeah. I, it's it's just simply not ridiculous. Like I don't want to keep stopping it, but I come thought on. there was a problem. Yeah, that, that, this is bad. So people is... who never lost a penny. So if you look at their 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 tax receipts, yep. you look at their their uh, the, what they made in 2019 right. versus 2020. Correct. If they they didn't lose any money. Yeah, no, it, it, it's based on your just just your income. So I think 75k a year was the cutoff. But also if you're a married couple, 150k, and if you have kids, and it's even more. So you've got like so I've got like a lot of active duty military friends, are getting thousands of dollars because you know they have kids and. But it's like why and, and they're like why why am i getting this is such a waste of taxpayer money you know what i mean do your duty no and goes bro people in the military are the biggest boot bootlickers bro like it like come on you got your friends dan crenshaw your friends they got money and they were like oh the american government gave me money like oof like they literally were they literally get money already from the american government in the, in the in the sense that they get their housing and all that shit paid for anyway, um, so why not in a crisis if you get a little extra? They already know how much we're spending on the military. They're literally in the military, like the, the acting like they're so hurt and triggered by the fact that people that have a decent amount of living, even up to seventy five thousand dollars, which are, you could still be living on the margins depending on where you live, that they got a check yeah, and all of a sudden he's just business that's I been thought suffering. The but money was allocated there's... to people that lost money because of the pandemic. No, no, no. Because that's we already have a system either. for that. It's unemployment insurance. Our, our system works fine for that. It, that and this is this was always my thing. It's like, look, I'm in favor of temporarily boosting payments. Someone said every paycheck Crenshaw Sweet Lou says every paycheck Crenshaw receives is from the government. Literally every single one. Those who are unemployed <laughs> on unemployment so insurance. You... When we spend money for him and his paycheck, it's okay. And we spend money for his health care because, you know, he's a representative. They get free health care, socialized medicine from us. That's OK. But when other people Usually get it, state run unemployment he's up in arms. runs at it, it, it's it's at a formula that would that would make sure that you're not making more than you would have if you were already employed because you don't want to have a disincentive to go back to work. Right. What we did in the initial stages of the pandemic was increase that to 600 an extra six hundred dollars a week if you're unemployed. I'm okay with that for a few weeks during hard times. The problem is Democrats want to keep it forever. And now every business I talk to is like, I can't hire people. I, I have so many job openings right now. Can't hire anybody because we still have it. It's $300 a week, but we still have it. It means people are getting paid to stay home. There's a distance. They're, they're making a purely rational financial decision. But again, I, that's one conversation. That's no, no, no. The, the, the real conversation is why would people be choosing to stay home for 1200 bucks? A month so one first off i don't even believe that wholeheartedly that people are staying home and not working because they get twelve hundred dollars a month where can you live off that that's like is that even fifteen dollars or not is that even 15 grand a year <laughs> like they can't hire on them because their wages are shit okay exactly so if you can't hire if you're not attracting the people don't you think if you offered them thirteen hundred dollars or fourteen hundred dollars a month which still isn't enough um that they'd come work for you so I think it's a more, uh, you know, it's more, it speaks more to the fact that people, even when people were making the $600 a week, were making more on unemployment than they're making working 40 hours a week, four weeks for the whole year. That's the real issue that we should be talking about. That's at least a debate to be had, you know, okay. during hard times. 
but the direct cash payments that's nuts that's nuts what are, what are the direct cash <laughs> that, payments? that's the free money that's, that's the, the free, free that's the free money so this is the people that even though they still make the same amount they made in 2019 yep. and yep. 2020 they got a big check for yep. no reason Acting like direct cash payments are crazy is is ridiculous because it's essentially the same thing as a tax credit, right? I mean, it's essentially the same thing as you know giving people tax a tax break and then distributing that money out whatever monthly, like kind of like the child tax credit. It's the same thing, and it's not free money, like Alicia Alicia says. It's not free money. It's our money, right? And so we're we pay taxes. So just in case something like unemployment, something some you know your feet fall underneath you, from underneath you or something happens in your life we got your back we live in a society and we protect and help each other out that's the point reason yep 100 dan crenshaw doesn't like that that seems crazy and that's if well you lose and your if job, you do the math that's well over 100 million people and they just got it they didn't ask for it they just received it so it's not something they're guilty of yeah yeah they just received it but 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 it gets to the cultural argument that we're talking about no there was no backlash for this even on the right, I remember, I remember, you know, I was, I was, I was a little frustrated with the president or, or the ex-president, Donald Trump. Whoa. Uh, the president I voted for. Crenshaw speaking out against Trump. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you know? I thought that was his, like, you know, his guy, yeah. his guy. Uh, he was, he was put. The only time he gets mad at Trump is when Trump is trying to actually help regular people. <laughs> Pushing for those $2,000 cash payments. <laughs> I said, but don't I'm you like, think that he was doing that politically? And I didn't vote for him. But that's the point. But don't you think but that that's was, the point? That's exactly that's exactly the point. There's an incentive now to pay people off with their own money. There's an incentive to actually good. help people yeah, he, was, when they're don't struggling. You think that he was in a desperation situation. Oh my god! Where he just wanted to get reelected. We don't. We can't have this that. In December, he was already he had already lost. Oh, so in December after yeah. he lost, yeah. he still. But he didn't think he lost. Wanted to like he help people. A different conversation. With oh, direct yeah, it's, cash. A good, it's a good conversation. Uh, he thought he was going to somehow or another get reinstated. I don't. I don't know if he ever truly believed that. But um, he was pushing for it. Yeah, he just, um, <laughs> this man <laughs> is not living in reality. He's not living in reality. He says Trump didn't think he was actually going to overturn the election. I, I mean, did you not see all the shit that happened January 6th? Trump, like, not calling the National Guard in to help, like, kind of feeling it out, seeing what was going to happen because of it. Like, <laughs> bro. Like, Rogan, come on. You're going to let him be like, oh, I don't know. Maybe he didn't really want to overturn the election. Bro, he was talking about it since he was talking about it before the election. If I don't, if I don't win the election, it's fraudulent. If I don't win the election, uh, so, you know, I got cheated. And then after the election, oh, I got cheated. The ballots, you know, Georgia, et cetera, et cetera. Like, come on, Rogan. What do you like? Well, come on. What are we on doing? The, on the victimhood side, that's this is the demise of the republic. When 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 people are comfortable with being bought off with their own tax dollars and being comfortable and more than that, comfortable with being told that they're victimized and that some other group that's that's is the demise of our republic for that victimization <laughs> right so it's this not is just that they're in a bad situation they're in a so bad somebody situation else someone did it to you and maybe it's the one percent maybe right. it's those those mean corporate yeah. giants and now those corporate giants are trying to get all woke and get on the democrats good side like they always do yeah why is that dan because they want to maintain their little piece of the pie that's where it gets tricky <laughs> right where they manipulate and the you party. support a party that does everything it can. You're in a party that does everything it can it can to ensure that those corporations continue to give to get not a little piece of the pie, the whole freaking pie. They get everything. They, they, this is really. Where heads are at, I mean, so you get dumber listening to this board. shit. Catch new episodes. Of the Joe. Wow. I didn't. I hadn't seen that whole thing, but that was that was pretty incredible. That was pretty incredible. Um, but that's the type of that's the type of crazy, calm talking, right wing nut job who doesn't know his asshole from a hole in the ground that you get when you have these neoliberal bullshit policies under a democratic administration, which leads to depressed turnout, which then leads to some crazy right winger like Trump or like Pence or like uh, you know, and actually an actual competent crazy right winger like Pence or Dan Crenshaw or Tom Cotton, who the other day just said we need to put more people in prison, even though we have 25 percent of the world's prison population with only five percent of the world's population. 
so you know, I guess to bar- to borrow from to borrow from Ber- Bernie in, in the old Bernie Sanders movement. I guess we just gonna keep fucking around and we gonna find out. Uh, you know what comes after a uh, neoliberal democratic administration, and it might it's gonna be something probably way scarier than Trump. Which then people, you know, once we have President. Tom Cotton or Dan Crenshaw or some shit, Mike Pence or something like that. People are going to be like, oh, we miss Trump. At least he didn't do this. At least he didn't do that. Just like they did with George Bush. History repeats itself. All right. We're going to do one. We're going to do one more story. Um, or maybe we'll do two quick ones. Let me catch up on these super chats real quick. Um, let's see. Jameson Don, appreciate the appreciate the uh super chat. Justin, I tweeted at you at add me, please, so I can message you. Okay. Got you. Fractal, appreciate the again, fractal. Going crazy. Five dollars. Super chat. You're welcome. Helping fellow black man. Let's go. Detroit in the house. Oh, love that. Love that. Yeah, that's where my uh, dad's side of the family is from. I spent a lot of time in Detroit. Remember and repeat these chats forever wherever you go online and in person. I'm done now. All right. Appreciate that, Fractal. Thank you, man. And appreciate all the insight too. All you guys' super chats have been great today. Shadow ban refugee, uh, six dollars sixty six cents. There you go. Um, appreciate that. Dan Crenshaw got free taxpayer dollars to be a U.S. extremist overseas, mm-hmm. and now gets free taxpayer dollars to be a terrorist enabler in Congress. <laughs> that's good, and then that's true. Rabbit red eye. Appreciate the five dollars. Another reason why SNL sucks making Dan Crenshaw famous and for being a victim of cruel jokes. Side note, thoughts on Darnold going to the Panthers? Oh, is he actually? I didn't know that. I think Sam, he he got out of uh, New York, and I think he's going to do really well. Um, Crazy story about Sam Darnold. I know most of you guys probably aren't into football, but he's the quarterback. He was like a first-round pick for uh, the Jets, and now he's on the Panthers, I guess. But I actually – helped host him in college when i first got to college i was a freshman and he was i don't know junior or something and he came on a visit and me and clayton who was my college quarterback we hosted him uh on northwestern's campus and i see him at where i uh, get my physical therapy too so i I wish him the best colin radish carter appreciate the two to the two bucks it's just two rich white men talking rich yep Mm -hmm. i mean that's that's america Jonathan Boyle, appreciate the uh, the super chat. It's not logically consistent to believe in trickle down economics and also be in favor of means testing. These right wing hacks aren't even trying. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean they don't have they don't know none of nothing they say is rational. Like you know they'll decry something over here and then be completely hypocritical. Like 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 Mitch McConnell with the corporations thing, right? The crazy thing about Mitch McConnell is his name. McConnell is on the uh what is it, the court case um for Citizens United. It's literally Mitch McConnell's name. It's like Mitch McConnell versus the F- FEC. And you know, obviously that's was one of the landmark legislations that allow corporations to be determined as like people, um, like delineated as people, and so they can give however much they want uh into politics and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then he goes out and says corporations need to stay out of politics. Like, I mean, you can't hypocrisy shame these people into actually doing the right thing. This is why I don't talk about the right, you know, right wing conservatives a lot. One, they have no power right now, so th- they're pretty much irrelevant um, other than framing arguments and getting uh, Joe Biden to uh, even listen to them when we know that that they don't support anything progressive. They don't support anything that's like, actually going to help working people and just want to stall shit. Um, he goes out and says corporations need to stay out of politics. So there's, don't, don't, even, don't even pay attention to them. It's dumb. It's it's pointless. You're just wasting time. And the fact that, you know, another, you know, huge red flag for me, I know for a lot of the progressives, was the fact that progressives in Congress were just talking about Republicans, like even after the election, like after Joe Biden was inaugurated. So Republicans did this, Republicans did that. The Republicans have no power right now. So can you please talk and and direct your ire towards people that actually have power can change stuff? Otherwise, again, you're just virtue signaling. Thomas, appreciate the super chat. The bank's got trillions. This guy's a clown. No one should take him seriously. Exactly. That's that's that's, that's the energy I just came at that with. So I, I agree with you, man. Okay, let me let me look at some of. The, I don't want to miss the 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 actual chat box. So Ruben Lopez, Raider fan, but rock rocking with you. Appreciate that, man. The Vegas Vegas new stadium is awesome. 
Can't wait to play in that next year. Justin Jackson for California governor has to be repeated once in a while. Sorry for the repeat. Hey, maybe. No more actors for Prez. I suffered through Reagan. That had to be rough. I'm not into football. I'm into football a bit. Cool, cool. Uh, hopefully, I can get you guys into football a little bit more. Even if you just 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 support just support me, you know. I'll, I'll I'll we'll talk about football. You know, I'll teach you guys a little bit. You guys can root for me. I'll root for you guys. You know, it's a cool little symbiotic relation we got going on. We play football with feet where I live. Yeah, we play football. Yeah, I play football. The original football. Bush was looked at as a pushover and idiot. Trump was looked at as an idiot and villain. I think that's that's pretty accurate. Justin, Eric, appreciate the super chat. Talk about CAA. What is that? Represent Biden, Jank, Mayher, Colbert, Noah, Cuomo, Cooper, Kanye, Gaga, Bay, Grande, Peel, Freeman. I'm not sure what this means. Maybe elaborate in the in the chat. Please read my super chat on respect. Did I miss it? Alicia Moses, appreciate the $1 super sticker. Nice. Don't want to interrupt, but before you end the pod, can you say where you, who you are most excited about in this draft? Proud of your activism, by the way. Okay. I'll make sure to, I'll make sure to do that before the end. I missed, okay. Harry C. Smith, appreciate the super chat. Pentagon spends $2.5 billion a day. Isn't that ridiculous? That's ridiculous. Every single day. Barely 33 days of their budget will pay off all outstanding medical debt in the U.S. Wow. Wow. That's that's crazy. All medical debt. Thir so 30 days of America just not being an imperialist force around the world would pay off all the medical debt of the people in this country, which would obviously alleviate pain from who? Pain and suffering from who? Working class people who can't afford it. That would be an actual redistributive policy, so they can't they can't support anything like that. Okay, frac fractal. I might have missed it. Let me uh let me try and find it before I do this last um before I do this last story, and then I gotta run. But it's been man, it's been fun being with you guys. But we're gonna do we're gonna do one more we're gonna do one more story. So don't worry. I'm not getting off quite yet. I must have missed. Okay, here we go. Oh, I read this already. Fractal respect can't be coerced or negotiated. Dr. Corner West said that even the squad can hurt people. No relationship with progressives should require ass kissing. Yeah, I read that one. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, so this 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 also happened today. And so I want to show solidarity with these folks. Um, and also well, let's let's look at let's look at what Kamala Harris said first the other day. This is this is what and I covered this. Um, I did a video on this, but this is what Kamala Harris had to say about water and why it's why it's so important to have water infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. I also, you know, I'm in a lot of meetings on foreign policy. You know, for years and generations, wars have been fought over oil. By in us. A short matter of time, they will be fought over water. Probably also by so us. When we think about building up our economy around our infrastructure on something like water policy. It's literally about jobs. It's about the fundamental source of life that Tammy Duckworth is talking about. It will sustain life. And it's about strengthening up our nation around a commodity that is a precious commodity. And, you know, they all, she, she's so, oh, she's such a good politician. She cracks her voice. It sounds like she really cares about people and she cares about this infrastructure and getting water to people. Even though, you know, under Joe Biden, her president, Flint went without clean water, still doesn't have it. Even though they went through a whole eight years of, of a Democratic administration and they proposed a woefully, woefully insignificant and a joke of an infrastructure package that doesn't come even close to the 2017 number that the Army Corps of Engineers or whatever um, said was needed. So now she said that. That was what? Yesterday, two days ago? And then we see this happen. She cares so much about water, right? And people's access to clean water and how it's the fun fundamental um, thing for life that we need to protect. Well, here's from Earth Justice breaking. The Biden administration will allow oil to continue to flow to the Dakota Access Pipeline despite the ongoing threats it poses to the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and the fact that it is operating illegally. We will not stop fighting. 
Is this not so symbolic of the Democratic Party? On the one hand, on the one hand, she's out here cracking, cracking her voice. She cares so much. She cares so much about clean water for people. Two days later, two days later, the Biden administration is allowing this pipeline go through a, na- a native land and a native water source who they say they care so much about, right? We care so much about our indigenous brothers and sisters. We put Deb Holland as the Secretary of Interior. But when it comes to actually g- providing them with clean water by axing a, a, an oil pipeline, I thought we cared about climate change. Why are we still instit- why are we even still building pipelines? Letting letting oil flow just into the country for I think this is what is the is it from North Dakota or is this one from oh, the Keystone was from Canada. Regardless, so I thought we cared about all this shit, but of course not. Of course, if you look just beneath the surface and just be- beneath all their bullshit that they parroted uh, to your face with, with, with the crack in their voice that they care so much, uh, that they act like they care so much, if you just look a little below the surface, they're freaking letting the Dakota's access pipeline continue to go through these people's native land, threatening the only clean source of water that she was just talking about was absolutely you know necessary that that everyone needs it's just it's just it's just unbelievable they lie they lie about everything where, where where's the mainstream media talking about how much joe biden has lied where's the mainstream media talking about kamala harris lying and having a lie counter to see how much they've lied throughout the past 100 days 100 105 days where's that it's it's nowhere to be found. And this is, of course, where the right wing does have a point. Because the mainstream media will not do shit to stand up to Joe Biden, to call out Joe Biden's lies or any of that. They'll call out Donald, Donald Trump's lies all day, all day long. Great. I'm glad. They should be holding the president to account. But when it comes to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, different story. This probably won't even get covered. I guarantee you this won't get covered. Let's go through the, the article just a little bit. Speaking before a federal judge today, okay, so first off, despite promises to listen to tribes and fight climate change, Biden administration allows oil to continue flowing through Dakota Access Pipeline. The pipeline has no permit. It doesn't even have a permit. It's an affront to tribal sovereignty, jeopardizes drinking water supply for Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Speaking before a federal judge today, representatives from the Biden administration's U.S. Army Corps of Engineers indicated that the agency will not shutter the, the will not shutter the Dakota Access Pipeline, DAPL, despite the ongoing threats it poses to the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and the fact that it's operating without a federal permit. Although President Joe Biden recently announced intentions to approve tribal consultation, of course he announced that, and initiate long-term action to tackle climate change, his administration took a stance today that was identical to that of former President Trump. Here's the new boss, same as the old boss, and who's still getting screwed over? indigenous people in this country going 400 500 years strong (laughs) it's just unbelievable and of course he's of course he comes out and signals that he's gonna protect these people and he won't uh you know he'll improve the tribal consultation initiate long-term action he's not gonna do any of that shit he doesn't care about that he doesn't care about you what he cares about is money profits and his donors that's what he cares about if his he already said he's not gonna end fracking He's not going to end fracking. So his values are set, right? His values are set, and we know what they are. He does not value clean water. He does not value the earth. He does not value um, you know, mitigating climate change. He'll virtue signal to it. He'll talk about it so the mainstream press can cover it, and most of the people who don't pay attention to politics can think he's actually doing something. But when it actually comes down to the details, he'll do the complete opposite and he'll be the same as former President Trump on this issue. Let's continue. Earlier this year, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe leadership and others sent letters to Biden asking him to shut down DAPL while the U.S. Army of Court. Army Corps of Engineers performs an environmental and safety review to t- determine whether the controversial pipeline is safe to operate. An oil spill could poison the tribe's drinking water and millions downstream will face downstream face a similar risk well i wonder if there's any evidence to show to tell us 
whether this pipeline going through their main drinking water source will be a problem, will be a threat. I just wish there was some evidence somewhere in this society to show us if this is dangerous for these people's drinking water. God, I just wish there was something. <laughs> like, like, this is ridiculous. And they, this is what they always do. They always say, we'll, 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 we'll put it through a committee. When it comes to reparations, we're going to create a committee to think about it. And all that means is we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll say we'll create a committee. Um, so all the, you know, liberals will think we're doing something. The press will get off our back and then we'll move on to the next story. The pipeline was built through the tribe's unceded ancestral lands without its consent and construction decimated its tribal sacred sites. This is just so gross. Ugh. We are gravely concerned about the continued operation of this pipeline, which poses an unacceptable, unacceptable risk to our sovereign nation. And, and you can't even call it sovereign at this point if, they, if the United States government can just go in there and destroy literally sacred sites. They're just going through sacred sites and literally say, no, nah, F that. We're going to just put a pipeline through your drinking water. And if it busts and all this oil spills into the water that you drink, uh, too bad. <laughs> In a meeting with members of Biden staff earlier this year, we were told that this new administration wanted to get this right. Unfortunately, today's update from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers shows it has chosen to ignore our pleas and stick to the wrong path. See, for me, I think it's even more insidious than that. I think they know what the right thing is. They know how to get it right. But they're choosing not to. It's an active decision. It's an active decision, and we need to treat it as such. I, that's it on that. That that that's it on that. It's just <laughs> America is an existential threat to America. Facts, Danny. Facts. Insidious. That gross. Hell, it's it's legalized criminality. Mm -hmm. Human beings will be poisoned. So uh, that's the that's the society we're living in. That's the society we're living in. You know, we're doing everything we can to change it. We're organizing stuff. We're speaking out on it. But, you know, it's 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 tough. It's tough. Let me do one more quick one. One more quick story because I just want to make sure I cover this. Um, because this was crazy. And Jackson Hinkle sent it to me yesterday. So I want to make sure I share it with you guys. This was from Human Rights Watch Watcher, and I and I'm pretty sure um, Queer Ally Mode, born and raised in the belly of the beast. Oh, because co-host Soapbox. So this is one of the co-hosts of the Soapbox, um, and this happened to I think him. Yeah, this happened to him yesterday. I'm really shaken up right now. Oh, let me make it bigger for you guys. No, not that. Can you guys see that? Yeah, it's fine. I'm really shaken up right now. I, I was just visited by two plainclothes police officers from California Highway Patrol in my home. They said they came here on behalf of the Capitol Police and accused me of threatening AOC on Twitter yesterday. This is provably false. I assume this is the tweet they are talking about where I likely, lightly criticized AOC for a disappointing answer in response to a question about Palestine. Palestine Israel and the tweet was on April 1 AOC did a live stream with Michael Miller the head of the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York she was asked about peace between Israeli and Palestinians her response was incredibly underwhelming to say the very least and I'm sure a lot of you guys have saw that so the fact that this happened like when Jackson sent, sent that to me I was like police state shit like that's police state stuff you're criti you criticize a politician on twitter and all of a sudden you get the cops show up at your house what i mean if that can that can happen to them it can happen to anybody it can happen to anybody so orwellian yeah that is orwellian and i remember um the first time i saw something like this happen was in i, I believe it was december when let me let me here we go this was in this was in december Florida, Florida police raid home of former state COVID-19 data scientist. Florida police raid the home of a former state coronavirus, coronavirus data scientist on Monday, escalating a feud between the state government and a data expert who has accused officials of trying to cover up the extent of the pandemic. Wow. 
So that that was kind of the first I that was the first I had seen something like that happen, and then seeing that happen to you know the co-host of Soapbox. That's scary, Rebecca Jones. Yeah, her name was Rebecca Jones. That's scary. That's scary stuff. So you know we're seeing the foundations of this you know neo fascism. You know that people like Chris Hedges have been warning about for a long time. I highly suggest to read Chris Hedges. I'm reading um, America the Farewell Tour right now. But this is ex- this is exactly this is exactly what he's been warning about, and you know we've been seeing the like the foundations of this being set up. So I don't know. Some Dizzy Sadeko says, "How did they know the address of the person's home, though? How did they know that they tweeted, etc.? That's horrifying." Yeah. Exactly. Someone said a state cop. I'm calling BS secrets. Don't blink said a state cop. I'm calling BS secret service would be the agency responsible responsible for the case. Well, I mean, it's let's not put it beyond the pale that they could have had some type of, you know, undercover fake ID type thing where they're um, they are secret service or they are, I don't know, FBI or something. And they're posing as California State Patrol or whatever it was. You can't put you we can't put any of that past the realm of possibility. So. I don't know. That's that's scary stuff. That's the scary stuff. Um, that's gonna be it for the show. Let me get to the last super chats. Someone said Jimmy's on Tucker right now, so y'all can go check that out. Uh, let me read these last few super chats, and then I'm gonna hop off. I have to pee like so bad right now, but I'm holding it. I'm holding it. Okay, we. Okay, one more pop reality. Thanks so much for the super chat. We support you. Um, we support you the long way, bro. As a young black man, I now understand the value of black perspective. It's invaluable facts. Facts. I mean, we, we know and understand our, you know, our experience, right? And we, we are, we experience a different types of hardships, different types of oppressions, um, than others. And so, you know, I like to, you know, I like to speak out, speak my mind, um, speak about my experiences. So. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate the support. Smash the like button. Like, 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 like now. Thank you, Lane Mat- Matson. Let me, let me, let me, let me show that. Everybody go ahead, go ahead and do that. Don't injure your bladder, sir. Take care of it while you are at your prime age right now. Look, my, my, <laughs> my grandma and my dad, when we were on road trips, they would not want to stop. They would not want to stop. So I'd have to hold my pee for like literally an hour. So. I've I've built I've built it up. I can do it. Excellent show, Justin. Thanks, Catherine. I appreciate it. Thanks everybody um, for joining in the stream. You know, I haven't streamed in a while, so I'm glad I could I could do this for y'all. I'm glad we could hang out. Uh, we could talk. You know, I love reading the chat. Love reading your super chats. Um, so I really appreciate it. I don't know if I'll be streaming this weekend. Maybe on Sunday. Uh, that's really unhealthy, Justin. I, I try not to do it too often, um, but I do have the capability. <laughs> But uh, pre- yeah, I appreciate everyone for joining in. Make sure to hit the like. Um, make sure to subscribe. Turn the notification bell on so you know when my, my uh, videos drop. Um, yeah, everyone have a great weekend. And, and we'll be back at it uh, soon enough. Peace.